subscribe. We're going to the London Zoo. I'm recording. <laughs> What's up everybody? I'm here at the London Zoo with some of my friends checking it out and uh, it's amazing to be here. London Zoo is one of the oldest zoos in the world. It's been here for 197 years, who's counting, and it actually started off as a private research facility but needed to open up to bring in some money to fund the research that they do. And even today it exists without any government support. So they do it all on their own. So really cool to see, and I'm excited, more importantly, to see what turtles and tortoises and other animals I can find while I'm here at London Zoo. Sorry. Oh my gosh. So beautiful. Look like Harry Potter characters, those ears. I love you guys. I found my people. Nice temperature. Just checking out some butterflies with leading turtle minds from around the world. We call that crossover. just got out of the butterfly area which had an atlas moth this moth that is so big and excuse me sir could you could you tell me where the cremota dragon house is you look really short i am really short <laughs> the cremota dragon <laughs> the cremota dragon <clears throat> they are they have cremota dragons here they do i'm ready to go, we see, go them. see them we will stay tuned london zoo Check it out. I wasn't going to come over here, but Casey Leone told me I had to. When's the next time you're going to be able to see an Asiatic lion? The answer that I had for her is probably never. And now I get to say that I saw one. So thanks, Casey, for the assist. This is the habitat of the Chinese big-headed turtle. This species is extremely rare uh, in both in captivity and in the wild, and it is even more rare, uh, incredibly rare, almost never happens, that this species is bred in captivity. It's something that's happened in California, in New York, and here at the London Zoo. In front of the habitat of one of the most unique and, and odd creatures in the world, the Chinese giant salamander. And right now, we're going to lure it over with some food, maybe, as long as it isn't scared by my face behind the glass. There goes nothing. I may have scared the giant salamander back into its cave. Uh, Kim was very helpful, came in and put some kind of fish water taste in the, into the habitat, which normally brings her out, but of course she's not coming out. Uh, but that's okay. It's amazing just to stare into her beautiful eyes and wonder what she's thinking, uh, probably about fish water. But uh, these animals here are actually juveniles. They're around uh, 
one meter in length, three feet in length. But as adults, Kim was telling us they reach almost six feet, almost two meters in length and will weigh 50 kgs, which is uh, around 100 pounds. Pretty amazing stuff. Okay, bye, sweetie. Nice to meet you. Right behind me are the Titicaca frogs, and they are described as a fully aquatic species. So they kind of just sit there on the bottom like that, and they absorb most of the oxygen that they get through their skin. So we know frogs can breathe through their skin, but these frogs really breathe through their skin, and they are one of the most unique and odd little frogs I've ever seen in my entire life. So this habitat here for the Philippine crocodile is, is really beautiful. There's a lot of things going on in here with kind of a zoopoxy cement type of uh, building of the habitat up high and even at the mid-level. But this also goes down below ground level. Where we're standing right now, um, this habitat goes down so it's deeper. The water is extremely clear like you'd, like you'd expect to see at a very nice zoo. But what's really interesting here is there's all sorts of duckweed and almost this kind of uh, um, uh, algae uh, growth in here that's been left to be a part of the natural habitat, which really does create more of a, a bioactive situation where these plants are helping to clean the water. And they really are a natural thing. I see a lot of people oftentimes say that they don't want any green in their turtle habitat, but uh, it really is a part of the natural areas that these animals call home and this looks extremely natural and realistic even a step better than that in how clean and creatively designed this is it's cool to see so as casey's getting the shot i might as well talk about it uh, this habitat here where this crocodile lizard is living is a perfect example of what can be designed for a myriad of semi-aquatic species like turtles and you see here, they've got this live moss. It's got this running water. The water's clear. There's leaf litter. There are plants where the animals can kind of tuck in underneath and feel secure. You have everything here that you'd want to provide a healthy, uh, uh, biosecure and, and bioactive habitat for whatever type of species might need it. It's awesome to see. This animal is really, really impressive. One last thing about this habitat, these are white cloud minnows that, that live in here with the crocodile lizard. White cloud minnows are probably extinct in the wild and they come from the same habitat as the Quangtung river turtle, which is also extinct in the wild. So uh, we keep those in our greenhouse with the turtle species and they're actually really cold tolerant and they're really commonly kept and breed well in captivity. The more you know. As we walk around the corner of the exhibits here, one really interesting thing is kind of this kind of shrine, for lack of a better word, to big turtles. And it commemorates not only the zoo's work to keep and protect and breed this species in captivity, which we know is often a last ditch safeguard against true extinction, but also uh, commemorates and celebrates the work that they're doing to preserve and conserve this species in the wild. So there's uh, this attractive uh, model statue of a big-headed turtle climbing right up a tree, which we know this species is absolutely terrific at climbing. And uh, it's just kind of, like I said, a nice shrine and, and celebration of the species in general and the London Zoo's work to help ensure that this species is here for generations to come in the wild where turtles belong. Now, there aren't a lot of turtles at this zoo, as you've noticed, but there is a lot of signage and things to educate people. This is on the global turtle crisis, the Asian turtle crisis, uh, and, and the importance of turtle care. It's pretty awesome. A lot of the species here are ones that we know that we've featured on the channel before uh, and that really need all the help that they can get, both in captivity and in the wild. So it's nice to see the zoo actually committing to this important cause that we care so much about. So we just went behind the scenes where this zoo keeps both Moremi's anamensis, a Vietnamese palm turtle, and also the Rhodey Island snake neck, uh, Chelidina macordi, which are both very, very rare turtles that are functionally extinct in the wild. They have them off exhibit here, um, 
but we were able to go back and see them. Now, the zoo has asked that we don't share any of the footage of the behind the scenes stuff. So I'm sharing footage right now from other zoo trips where we've seen those species. Remember those snake neck turtles are the ones that are being released into the wild on Rhode Island via the Singapore Zoo. And Anamensis is a species that we breed really readily. I've actually got eggs hatching at home right now. I'm going in. I don't even know what to call this place. It is so tropical in here. I would refer to this as a, a biodome of sorts. Please forgive the 90s reference. And speaking of 90s references, all of the Galapagos tortoises in this habitat were actually born in the 90s. 1995 to be exact, which makes them all exactly 30 years old. Now, these Galapagos tortoises are actually Kelanoides becki, which is the Vulcan wolf tortoise. So it's a specific type of Galapagos tortoise that you may not have seen before. Now, I happened to see this species at the Bronx Zoo about 14 years ago, 13 years ago, the, the last time before last that I was there and they had some small Vulcan wolf tortoises. So it's interesting to see these here. It's really rare and interesting to see Galapagos tortoises on display that are ever known locality, known island, known species. Usually we just say it's a Galapagos tortoise, which really these days only means we know the genus. And a lot of times the Galapagos tortoises that we see in captivity are actually hybrids, uh, intergeneric hybrids um, at this point, because they are, again, different species within the same genus. Pretty cool to see these guys. Now, why build this huge dome of a habitat? for these animals. There was actually a talk last year at the European Tortoise Alliance, which is the amazing event that I just uh, spoke at myself along with other Americans like Tony Monahan and Chris Leone. Uh, last year, they spoke about this habitat, why they were building it, and the reason was because these guys who have lived together for a long time started to have some roommate quarrels, we'll call them. And uh, they were in a little bit of a smaller space than this. Now they're in this absolutely expansive, massive habitat that really feels like we're in Ecuador right now, that we're in the Galapagos Islands right now. It's amazing. In the wild, these tortoises have natural puddles and wallows that exist within their habitat across the landscape. So you see that they're, they're also provided with this here in the zoo. Uh, we have here water that probably stays a little bit cleaner and then water off to the side there that gets muddy. And they definitely like the mud as well, uh, which has a bunch of benefits in addition to helping them escape from the heat. I'm really impressed with this habitat. I think it's the best that I've seen for Galapagos tortoises ever. And I've seen a lot of Galapagos tortoises because a lot of zoos keep a lot of uh, Galapagos tortoises. So when we come to look at zoos looking for turtles and tortoises, we want to see some dedication to those animals, right? It seems like they're always forgotten at zoos and aquariums that always want to focus on the animals that bring people through the turnstiles. Well, this at first glance may not seem like a place that is dedicated to turtles because they don't have that many turtle species here, right? Tony Monaghan, when he wrote his book, listing all of the zoos that have turtles and tortoises, he had a rule that if they didn't have at least five species, he wouldn't 
highlight them in the book. Now this zoo is right on the cusp there. It's right there on the borderline. It's the London Zoo. You'd hope to see some more. But let me tell you something. They are dedicated to their turtles. And you know why? There's signage everywhere letting people know about the Chinese big-headed turtle and how important it is to conserve them in the wild and ex situ here in captivity like with programs like this and the ones in the U.S. that breed them, the few in the U.S. that breed them. Then you look at the Galapagos tortoises, and not just any Galapagos tortoises, but they actually know the species that they're working with, which is so rare. And then they dedicate this massive building to keeping those animals safe and sound for decades to come so impressed by the London Zoo and what they've done, particularly for big-headed turtles and Galapagos tortoises, and throw in a couple other turtle species there. Their habitats are awesome. I'd love to see the algae there. If you're ever here, come check it out. Even some of those habitats that are used for some of the amphibians, the other reptiles, really do give you some amazing ideas for what you can do with your turtles. Thanks for checking it out. Don't be afraid to hit like, subscribe, hit that bell icon, tell your friends, do all the things. I appreciate you. We're really doing it. London, it's been nice. Time to get home to my turtles. I'm here in the gift shop now. One last thing before I take off at the London Zoo. And I thought I'd share something with you that I never have before. I collect iron-on patches. So every time I visit a zoo, and I've been doing this for over 15 years, my wife and I, anytime we visit a zoo or I visit a zoo, I always get the iron-on patch from the zoo. So I want to know when you travel, when you're out there doing your reptile-related things, is there anything that you collect, anything that you try to pick up while you're out that you that you like to uh, kind of amass to, to uh, commemorate the places you've been? And if you haven't, let me recommend iron-on patches because most places have them. Pins as well are really cool. Most places have pins now. I think pins are even more popular than these now. But to me, there's just something kind of archaic and classic about an iron-on patch. Hit subscribe and join the crew. Just turtles. There's always something new. Sir, you have to pay for that. <laughs> the only animal that likes zoos more than humans. Squirrels. It's seven o'clock on the dot. I'm in my drop top cruising the streets. I got a real pretty, pretty little thing that's waiting for me. Oh, hey, I thought I heard someone back here. Wait a minute. If you're here, then that means you just watched that video all the way till the end, which is pretty amazing considering our videos tend to be a little bit long and I'm also long winded. So thank you. Thank you for being a part of this community. Thank you for making the world a better place for turtles and tortoises, because it really means a lot. Oh, that was weird. Anyway, since you watched this long, if you haven't already subscribed, you should consider doing so via this link here in the corner of the screen. Also, if you like this video, I know you'll love our other videos, which you can access here in the other corner of the screen. Like the drip that you saw during the video? I know you did, and yes, I know I'm old. You can access that via this QR code here. And lastly, my Amazon author page, because I am a turtle author. I've written several books about turtles. You can access via this QR code.